Minister, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you and maybe and discuss with you later on. It's a privilege for me to be in Ireland. Uh, unlike Christine, I have only been here once before for one day in Dublin, and that was uh, that was uh, 25 years ago. So I agree, much has changed as far as I can remember Dublin from the from the one day I spent here. Um, I should explain that I am neither an expert in educational matters, nor am I a politician. I'm a permanent secretary of the Ministry for Science, Education and, uh, and Research in Iceland. And uh, uh, my background is from the legal profession, according to the taxi driver who took me to Dublin from the airport, I belong to one of the most hated profession <laughs> in the country, apart from politicians. <laughs> it is words are to be taken literally. <laughs> but I, I do hope that as a civil servant, I will uh, um, not as much disliked in this audience. Uh, before I uh, touch upon the topics of the afternoon uh, relating to challenges, I would like to tell you a little bit about the uh, education system in Iceland. This was the overview. I have to tell you immediately that it had, my, uh, in, my uh, presentation has changed so much since last night and after this morning, so I'm not sure it's still valid. But let's go immediately to the structure of the system. Actually, to save time, Anders made a very good presentation this morning about the general character, char characteristics of the Nordic education system. There are only two things that I would like to add because I think it is important and th those are the preschools because even if they are not compulsory back home, 90% of Icelandic children do go to these schools. We, uh, they, they are considered now as the first level of education in Iceland even if we still refer to them in Icelandic as play schools. So they have their own curriculum and even though the education methods are different from compulsory education, they are still, they are still schools. They are funded mostly by municipalities, but one third of the cost is borne by payment from parents. But I, I think it is important to know that our children start earlier than six years of, of age in school. The second thing I wanted to add was about the upper secondary education because the, we have basically three types of schools here. It's grammar schools which first and foremost prepare you for academic uh, education and then we have industrial vocational schools and thirdly, and the, these, that's the biggest number, is what we call comprehensive schools, which combine both vocational and industrial education and then the, the grammar, grammar school education. So this has a relevance to what I will come to later on. Um, but of course, with my country, you can not really discuss anything without uh, coming to the question of economy. So I have to say a few words about that as well. And I notice that nobody thinks that Iceland is in an envious position, but here I think that we genuinely have something that we share with, uh, with Ireland. It is, uh, it is a backdrop, this crisis is a backdrop of everything that we do all our efforts that we are making in the field of education and in other fields as well of the public sector. The national production contracted in 2009 by some 6.7%. In 2010 it was 4% and this was the worst scenario since 1968 when it was dropped by 5.5%. 5, 5 the result, obviously, was a, a reduction in, in national expenditures and reduction in state contributions on all levels. The overall cut in government expenditure was 10% in 2009 and 2010 and a little bit less in uh, 2011 and 2012 and still in 2013 we are cutting, cutting the budget. 
I wanted to show you, and now I need the, the technician, to a little bit about the structure of the national budget for 2013. And so this is the recently pu published budget proposal for, for next year. And you see the total figure on top, this is Icelandic kroner. And the longest column there is welfare, health and social security. And you might be forgiven to think that the next column below is education, but it's not. It is the interest rate that we are paying off our foreign debt. The third line is the education. Education, actually, culture and research. So this is the scenario that faces us now. For, uh, now I will try to find the present presentation again. So for, uh, so for, um, so and this is the picture of uh, that uh, that is supposed to show you the how much we are have now lost in monetary terms from uh, from our sector. We we feel from the Ministry of Education, compared to 2008, we now have 23 percent less to spend on our universities and 15% less to spend on our schools at upper secondary level. At the same time, costs have gone up, and uh, the number of students in both levels has increased quite a bit. So it is challenging. In addition, unemployment also emerged as a problem in 2008 for the first time in, dec in decades. In December 2007, unemployment in Iceland was 0.8%, basically not, non-existent. But in December 2008, it was up to 5% almost, and then rose steadily to 9.1% in, in 2009. The numbers have just started to go down again, and in last month's figures were 5.6%. I understand and realize that these numbers are not so bad compared to so many other countries. But this was a new situation for Icelanders. Longer term employment is also a novelty to us. So this presents us with new issues to deal with that we have not seen before. And of course, a situation like this, and I don't have to tell you that, that this risks the well-being of children, of families, and also their their education and, and social cohesion, of course, becomes an issue. And now I come to the more uh, school-related uh, matters. In 2008, just before the crash, we had just recently started a reform on the first three levels of school. Uh, play school, compulsory, and upper secondary. And this concerned all aspects of all aspects of the school, we uh, wanted to introduce more flexibility into the system, both regards to, to parents and children's choices. There was uh, more autonomy put to the schools. They were made responsible for curricula and more aut autonomy to teachers and, and head teachers. The decentralization, I think, is a proper wording for it. We also reformed uh, teachers' education. It was decided at that time that for all levels you needed to have a master's degree to become a teacher and so and so forth. Also, you might have seen this morning uh, that we are we're not doing so bad on PISA. We are above average. We want to maintain the status of course and certainly improve, but in the wake of the crisis and while preparing new national curricula, for all three school levels, we also had to think about some of the things that Christina mentioned in her intervention. It is not only, it is not necessary to, only to know algebra, but we also want, to, we wanted to think about what kind of citizens we were graduating from our schools. And this thinking 
comes through in the new curriculum guidelines in that uh, they, uh, they have for, for all three levels, we now have a common part. And, the, and we have now uh, issued uh, for all of the, for all the, for all the three uh, uh, levels, new national curriculum guidelines which are based on the six fundamental pillars that you see on the slide. Now, uh, these pillars are literacy, sustainability, health and welfare, democracy and human rights, equality and creativity. While I understand that these, is, these issues are not a novelty, I am told that in the Iceland, by experts in the field, that the Icelandic curriculum go, goes deeper into these issues and also that it is a novelty that they run as a red thread through all the levels. And the intention with the, uh, with the, and the pillars, they should be, uh, and now I have to refer to my iPad, they should be a part of, uh, they should be used very actively on, at all levels in education. Uh, they, they should be a part of the choice of material and content of study, teaching and play should also reflect the fundamental pillars. Working methods and techniques that children and youth learn are, are influenced by ideas which appear in discussions of the pillars. And the, then procedures within the school of teachers and other school person, personnel should be based on this principle as well. And when school activities are evaluated, it should be observed whether and how the fundamental pillars are reflected in study, teaching and play. Uh, I could talk about these pillars for, for some time yet, but I think that this, these terms are familiar to all of you. So I think I will simply skip that for the sake of time. I can uh, answer questions about it later on. But I also wanted to say a few words about social uh, cohesion, in particular related to the, to the crisis. Uh, the strength of the Nordic schools ha has been discussed this morning, and, but I would particularly like to stress the importance that, that, that the, school, the importance that the school plays in times of crisis in keeping a society together and how important they are on the way to, the, on the way to recovery. In the wake of the crisis, well-being of families and children became an immediate concern for Icelanders. So in order to monitor the impact of the crisis on homes and families, we established what we call the Welfare Watch. This was an initiative made by the government. It is a joint project of national authorities, local authorities, uh, the labour market stakeholders, NGOs, and like the Red Cross associations of the disabled and elderly people. And of course, the Ministry of Education participated in the Welfare Watch. There is a steering group and which has uh, uh, subcommittees that are distributed all over the country. The task of the group was, it was and is to monitor the social and financial impact that, crisis had, that the crisis has had on families and homes and then to make suggestions on actions that would benefit the vulnerable homes and the families. The, uh, there, one of the ways that we have used to monitor the well-being of children is that teachers and head teachers have answered questionnaires which has, have been sent back to the national authorities and the results have been used to try to focus finances as little as they, they are to the, most, uh, in, uh, to the most vulnerable people. And uh, just to mention an example, if a child discontinues to be a subscriber to school meals, this is checked. The head teacher will check what is the possible reason? Because we don't want the children not to be able to, to have lunch during school time because of simple, be, simply because of poverty. Now, the school, the, this group has also uh, given many recommendations to Icelandic government and local authorities 
in areas other than education. Another tool that we have, that we have used to measure the well-being of students are national surveys that are done annually among students in grades 5 to, five to 9. And this is uh, one of the slides from this book, this book which presents, represents the results, or present them rather, from, uh, uh, from the last survey. It, it has just recently been published. And in this survey, we, have, we ask children about their well-being from very many angles. We ask, angles. We ask them about school. We ask them about participation in, in uh, social life in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, yeah, their relations with their parents, how do they feel, etc. And the good thing about it is that we have been doing this regularly since 1992. It has been done annually, so we now have a series of research about the well-being of Icelandic youth. And we can, when we get a new one like this year, we can measure it against the previous years to see if the overall well-being of our youth is going down. And this slide, I just picked out something to, uh, to show you. This is about the substance abuse, and it seems to be going down. And the good news for us are that overall, kids do not seem to be feeling a lot worse than they did before. But it is it's so important to have the research evidence to base it on. And another way that the schools have been uh, imperative in, let's say, contributing to social cohesion uh, is that after the crisis, the upper secondary schools were opened to uh, unemployed young persons. Everybody below the age of 25 could now come to school again and get education because, as you know, Unemployment, long-term employment will increase the risk of social exclusion. So we did, in collaboration, with, it should be said, with the social partners. They partly fund this effort with us. Schools were opened up for unemployed young people, and now we were hoping to kill two birds with one stone, uh, give them more education and a chance to develop their skills, and then try to avoid social exclusion. Yeah. That's what, this was the uh, last uh, point, actually. But I, ha I have to say shortly, even though I don't have the time to, uh, to uh, discuss it any further, that we have the same problem as anybody, as uh, the other uh, Nordic countries when it comes to dropout. <coughs> it is dropout, significant dropout at the upper secondary level. Also, uh, vocational training is a special issue for us, and uh, we have been trying to and are now making effort to turn, the, uh, to turn this uh, development around. And if I get a chance later on in the, in the panel, I could uh, tell you a little bit about that. But thank you.